For 12 days in January of 1984, residents in the Denver area of Colorado were living through something that seemed straight out of a horror movie. A series of brutal attacks by a hammer-wielding maniac that left four dead and four more seriously injured. It would take more than three decades to close these horrific cases using advances in DNA technology every step of the way before finally identifying Alex Ewing as the Colorado Hammer Killer. Let's get into it. Hello, Darklings. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Delaney and I'm a true crime writer and all around murder nerd. On this channel, I like to tell really terrible stories and I tend to cuss a lot. So if you're into that sort of thing, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool, you do you. But now let's go back to the 80s, 1984 to be specific. January 15th of that year was a Sunday in Aurora, Colorado, which at the time was a brand new suburb on the eastern edge of Denver. In fact, there was still a lot of construction going on in the neighborhood where the Bennett family lived. That Sunday was the day before Melissa Bennett's eighth birthday. That night, her family, her father Bruce, mother Deborah, and her three-year-old little sister Vanessa had had her grandparents and uncles over for a little family celebration. Since everyone had work or school the next day, the relatives left around 9 p.m. As they pulled away, though, they noticed that the garage door was open. Though that was unusual, they didn't really think too much of it at the time. Now, Bruce and Deborah were normally really punctual, hardworking people. So when they didn't show up for work the next day and they weren't answering their phone, their co-workers called Bruce's mother, Connie. Connie knew something had to be wrong, so she rushed back over to her son's home. When she got there, she noticed that the garage door was still open and her stomach sank. But she went inside the house anyway, and inside, at the foot of the blood-spattered stairs, she found her son's lifeless body. She was able to fight off panic long enough to call the police. Detective Marv Brandt with the Aurora Police Department arrived to find a violent, bloody scene. Bruce, who had apparently been trying to fight off his attacker, had been bludgeoned with what looked like a hammer and then had his throat slit. Upstairs, Brent found Deborah and the two little girls with massive head injuries. Thankfully, three-year-old Vanessa was still alive, but just barely. Her mother and older sister weren't so lucky. Vanessa was rushed to the hospital where she had to go through multiple surgeries. She had suffered several blows that crushed her skull and broke her jaw, arms, and legs. She'd also been sexually assaulted. She was in a coma for weeks, and because of the severity of her brain damage, it took several months for her to recover. At Melissa's autopsy, it was revealed that the eight-year-old had also been sexually assaulted. The semen found on her comforter and on the carpet under her body was taken into evidence, but this was 1984, so there wasn't really such a thing as DNA testing yet. Anyway, as they worked the crime scene, detectives noticed that Barbara's purse had been dumped out near the front door and the money had been taken out of it. The knife that had apparently been used to slit Bruce's throat was found tossed out into the snowy driveway, but the main weapon the killer used, a claw hammer, was never found. Despite how gruesome and shocking it was, this crime scene was looking familiar to Brandt. Only a week earlier, on January 9th, he had been called to the home of 20-year-old flight attendant Donna Dixon. She and her boyfriend, airline pilot Ron Holm, lived in another new subdivision not far from the Bennetts. And like the Bennetts' neighborhood, there was also a lot of new construction going up. Anyway, Holm had come home that evening from a long flight and found the garage all in chaos. Dixon's purse and the mail were scattered near the driver's side of her car, and later it would be discovered that all the money had been taken out of her wallet. Anyway, as Holm looked around some more, it got worse. On the passenger side of the car, he found her clothes and boots tossed to the ground and blood stains on the concrete floor. He looked inside the car and saw it was covered in blood, 
and a bloody claw hammer was lying in the driver's seat. So he rushed inside and noticed a trail of blood leading to the front door and he found Dixon lying in bed. Her head had been crushed in, but she was still breathing. That's when he called the ambulance and the police, which included Detective Brandt. Dixon was able to be saved, but she had sustained massive brain damage. She was in the hospital for two weeks and had to relearn how to do the most basic things like eating and talking. Even after she was released from the hospital, it took her months to rebuild her life. Unfortunately, because of the severity of her brain injuries, she had no memory of the attack. Now, in addition to the Bennett and Dixon cases, Brandt also saw similarities with another attack that had taken place just days before that on January 4th. Kim and Jim Hobbinshield were also Aurora residents living in a new subdivision with ongoing construction. They had been awakened by a man standing at the foot of their bed, a hammer raised over his head. When Kim screamed, he began beating them both with the hammer. He then took Kim's purse and fled, leaving Jim with a skull fracture and Kim with a concussion. But because it had been so dark inside their house, they couldn't see their attacker, so police were no closer to finding him. So while the Dixon and Haubenshield attacks had barely been mentioned in the local news, the Bennett murders dominated local and state news coverage. While Dixon wasn't in any shape to be talking to the media, TV news reporters did interview the Hobbinshields, who said they believed their attacker was the same man who had killed the Bennets. Detective Brandt also thought these three attacks were too alike not to be the work of one man. Now it was looking like a hammer-wielding serial killer was on the loose, so the residents of Denver and Aurora were flipping their shit, understandably so. Gun stores and pawn shops sold out of guns and ammo. There was a run on home security systems. Some neighborhoods even pooled their money to hire private security patrols. The local utility companies even instituted some new procedures and issued public statements to help residents safely identify their workers, both to set people's minds at ease, but also to protect their workers from the heavily armed and freaked out residents. As reporters were keeping the case in the news, they brought up another similar attack that had occurred in Lakewood, Colorado, which was just to the west of Denver. There, on January 10th, the day after Dixon was found bleeding in her bed, 50-year-old interior designer Patricia Smith was found dead just inside the door of her home, which was also in an area with a lot of new construction. She had been beaten with an auto body hammer and sexually assaulted. Her purse, too, had been dumped out and the money stolen. By now, these cases were gaining so much notoriety that on January 24th, FBI profiler Ron Walker flew down to Denver to review the cases and determine if the same person was responsible, and if so, to create a profile of the suspect. He spent two weeks interviewing the Aurora and Lakewood detectives, walking through the crime scenes and poring over the case files he soon came to believe that not only was the same man responsible for the Bennett and Smith murders, but the attacks on the Hobbinshields and Donna Dixon as well. His profile described the attacker as an unsophisticated burglar without the skills that more experienced criminals would have, like how to fence expensive jewelry or electronics. Because he'd stolen money from his victims, but he left behind much more valuable things that a smart thief could fence. He predicted that the man would be in his 20s with a record of theft or burglary and a possible drug or alcohol addiction. Walker also thought the man would be a construction worker since the attacks had all happened in areas with a lot of construction nearby. But worst of all, Walker predicted that the attacker would not stop until he either died or was arrested. After hearing Walker's belief that all the attacks were the work of one man, the Denver PD reached out to the Aurora and Lakewood police, offering their greater resources to create a task force to find the man who was now being called the Hammer Killer. But for whatever reason, the Lakewood police refused their offer. Anyway, residents of the Denver area braced themselves for another attack. They were locking their doors and windows, keeping guns near their beds, and some people even slept with helmets on. 
But just as suddenly as the hammer killer had appeared, he seemed to have disappeared, at least from Colorado. In the early morning hours of January 27, 1984, in his home on the outskirts of Kingman, Arizona, Roy Williams was awakened by an intense pain in his head. He woke to see a man standing over him with a large rock. Despite the intensity of the pain, he tried to stay calm and asked the man, why are you doing this? That seemed to throw his attacker off guard. So Williams later said that he was able to get him talking and eventually calm him down until he ran off into the night. Williams called the police, but since it had been dark, he couldn't describe his attacker. But luckily, police were able to find clear shoe prints on the ground outside Williams' home. Several hours later, a patrol officer noted a disheveled man hitchhiking near a large truck stop at the intersection of I-40 and US-93, which are two major transportation lanes and an excellent place to get a ride. It was also only about a quarter mile away from Williams' home. The officer asked the hitchhiker if he could have a look at his shoes. The tread appeared to match the impressions found at the crime scene. So the officer asked the man if he would be willing to come down to the station for further questioning. The man immediately bolted. Police were able to find him about 30 minutes later hiding behind a bush. The attacker was a 20-something construction worker with a long history of theft and burglary charges. His name was Alex Christopher Ewing. And for the attack on Williams, which left him with broken ribs and a gash on his head that took almost a hundred stitches, Ewing was charged with first-degree burglary and attempted first-degree murder. Now, the Denver PD had put out an APB for the unknown suspect in the hammer attacks there, but without a physical description, it really wasn't much help, so the Kingman police didn't really connect the crimes. Anyway, Ewing was booked and sent to the Mojave County Jail to await his trial. But that jail was dangerously overcrowded, so a few months later, he was transferred to the jail in St. George, Utah. In August, Ewing was sent back to Arizona to stand trial for the attack on Williams. He and several other inmates were taken for the five-hour trip in two vans with a guard in each one. None of the inmates were shackled or restrained in any way. Underneath his prison uniform, Ewing was wearing a pair of red shorts and black tennis shoes. The caravan stopped at a gas station in Henderson, Nevada to fill up and let the prisoners use the bathroom. Now, these bathrooms were the single-seater kind that are only accessible through a locked door that opens out onto the side parking lot rather than inside the gas station. Ewing was in the second group of prisoners who were escorted to the bathrooms. But while the guard who was supposed to be watching him was distracted by signing the gas receipt, Ewing managed to slip away into the desert. It was only after all the other inmates were loaded up and ready to leave that another inmate asked where he was. The guard searched for him for quite a while before finally contacting the Henderson Police Department. Henderson PD sent officers to help in the search, but by now, Ewing had a pretty good head start and they found no sign of him. But then, at about 10 p.m., two calls came into the Henderson PD. Both callers reported seeing a suspicious man lurking around their houses. They said he was wearing red shorts and no shirt, and he matched the description of Ewing. Then, only about an hour later, a 911 call came in. The woman on the other end of the line was 24-year-old Nancy Berry. She was in a panic. She told dispatchers she had seen a man standing at her back door holding an ax handle. She said she screamed and ran upstairs, but the man followed her and began hitting her and her husband, Chris, with the ax handle. She said she would played dead to get him to stop. Anyway, when the police arrived, they found the Berries in serious condition. They were both covered in bruises and blood, and a broken, bloody axe handle was left on a table. Both of Nancy's hands were broken from trying to defend herself, and Chris had even more severe injuries to his head. He would suffer from permanent brain damage from the attack. Thankfully, the couple's two children were unharmed. Police could see that their attacker had left a trail of blood and footprints they immediately started going door to door, searching for the man who they strongly believed was Alex Ewing. 
The police then expanded the search effort, eventually including helicopters. That attack and the massive search were front page news in both Arizona and Nevada, but for three days, there was no sign of him. Then a telephone operator called the police with some crucial information. Remember, this is the 80s, so if you wanted to make a collect call from a payphone, younglings, ask your parents what those are. You had to go through an actual human operator who could also listen in on your conversation if they wanted to. The operator said a man had made a collect call to a relative from a payphone near Lake Mead. She said she heard the man tell his relative that he'd escaped, and so she put two and two together. Now, Lake Mead is under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Park Service, so park rangers Mike Meyer and his partner were sent to the phone that the operator had identified and pretty much immediately spotted Ewing. He tried to run, but the rangers chased him down. He only surrendered when Meyer threatened to shoot him. Later, some officers on the Henderson Police Force criticized Meyer for not just shooting Ewing and saving taxpayers money. But Meyer's professionalism and self-control, besides just being the right thing to do, would later be crucial to solving the Colorado Hammer Killer cases. Anyway, the state of Nevada charged Ewing with two counts of attempted murder with a deadly weapon, escape, and burglary. It took the jury less than two hours to come back with a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to the maximum allowed under Nevada law, 110 years. In light of that sentence, the state of Arizona dropped their original charges against him for the attack on Williams. So Ewing now sat in a Nevada prison and the world would soon forget about him. Meanwhile, back in Colorado, the Hammer Killer murders were no closer to being solved. Weeks went by, then months, then years with no new leads. In 1989, the Aurora PD sent the semen stained comforter and carpet found at the Bennett crime scene to the Colorado Crime Lab for testing. Now, DNA testing was still pretty new at this point, so it took another year for the results to come back. They were able to find DNA on the comforter, but they could only retrieve a partial profile from it. It wasn't really enough to work with. Nearly a decade passed with no new leads. Then, in 1999, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation was able to find more semen samples from the Bennett crime scene. In 2001, they were able to extract a full DNA profile from these samples, but that DNA profile couldn't be matched to any suspect. So the following year, the police tried something that they'd never done before. They issued a warrant for the killer, but not by his name, but his DNA profile. That warrant listed six counts of first degree murder, one count of attempted first degree murder, two counts of first degree sexual assault, one count of first degree assault, two counts of sexual assault on a child, and first degree burglary. Investigators continued trying to match that DNA profile without any luck, but the DNA profile did help uncover one more clue. The crime lab was able to confirm that the DNA found at the Bennett crime scene matched the DNA found at Patricia Smith's crime scene. This confirmed what Aurora detectives and the FBI profiler Ron Walker had suspected all along. Despite how long the case had been cold, investigators refused to give up. They knew that advances in DNA science would be the tool that would eventually crack this case open. So in 2016, they again tried something new. They submitted the DNA samples to Parabon Nano Labs, which is a private genetic lab that was able to create an illustration based on traits found in the genetic profile. The illustration was of a white man with blue eyes and brown hair. Certain facial features like his nose width were also included in the illustration. Investigators also enlisted the help of forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick. Using the same techniques, used to find the Golden State Killer, she was able to narrow down the suspect list to a probable last name, Ewing. During this whole time, the Aurora PD was continuing to check CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System, for matches. The problem was not every state was contributing to the database. Nevada, in particular, had been especially reluctant to provide inmate DNA to the system. 
Finally, the Nevada Attorney General ruled that the prison system was required by law to take and submit DNA samples of all their inmates. It took the Nevada prison system a while to get around to complying, but in July of 2018, Ewing's DNA was finally uploaded into CODIS. Exactly one week later, the CBI was able to confirm a match between Alex Ewing and the DNA found at Smith's crime scene. Detectives flew out to Nevada to take a second sample, just to be sure, and to interview Ewing. Though Ewing admitted that he had lived in Denver in January of 1984, he denied any involvement in the murders. But DNA doesn't lie. The second test confirmed that it was Ewing's DNA at both the Bennett and Smith crime scenes. On August 10th, 2018, 34 years after the Colorado Hammer Killer attacks, the Aurora and Lakewood Police and the Colorado Bureau of Investigation announced that Alex Christopher Ewing was the prime suspect in the murders of the Bennett family and Patricia Smith. His attacks on Donna Dixon, Vanessa Bennett, and the Hoban Shields couldn't be prosecuted because the statute of limitations had run out. Anyway, after some legal bickering, he was finally extradited from Nevada and stood trial for the Bennett family murders in July 2021. He was found guilty on all counts and was handed down three consecutive life sentences. He was tried for the murder of Patricia Smith in April 2022. After only four hours of deliberation, he was found guilty on all three counts against him. He was given another life sentence, but since he's now in his 60s, that's probably not going to be a very long sentence. Looking back, I think it really was only thanks to Ranger Meyer's professionalism that this case was ever able to be cracked. If he had shot and killed Ewing that day in 1984, Ewing would never have been an inmate in the Nevada prison system, he would never have had his DNA tested, and the knowledge of his crimes would have gone to the grave with him. So what are your thoughts about Alex Ewing? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more terrible stories like this one. Till next time, darklings. You can help me make more true crime content by supporting me on Patreon, where for as little as a cup of coffee, you can get early access to videos, bonus content, and free Murder Nerd merch. The link is in the description.